Well, thank you guys for being here, of course. Uh, my name is Jonathan Rogue. Uh, I am a board member with the Flotation, uh, with the Flow Conference, and I'm here to share something that I started sharing last year, and that's based on the automation tools that help you run your float center. Um, in particular, it doesn't actually have to be digital. It doesn't have to be physical. I mean, there are a number of different automation tools. In fact, there are automation life hacks. You could automate your wake up routine or number of things that just help you be a business, a better business owner, help you be facilitate better float sessions and so on and so forth. So uh, with that said, um, I'll just kind of brief with you guys like why this actually became a thing for me personally, uh, because the truth is, is that, well, the automation has been something that is kind of important in my life. Uh, and I think that in a way, no matter who you are, we use automation every single day in almost everything we do. If you don't even realize that we do it. So, uh, and I can probably lead you into a couple examples, but I started off with a challenge and my challenge was just. I mean, there's a, dozens and dozens of challenges in running a business, right? But like just one real specific example, I had a challenge of needing to um, organize call records and uh, and find a way for my team and myself in, in particular back when I first opened to be able to track calls that would come in. And uh, ironically enough, one of my favorite tools, which is also a favorite tool of Graham and Ashcon, is the Let's see if anyone knows. You know what it is? Take a guess if you know what this tool is that Graham and Ashcon also love. Spreadsheet. Oh, yeah. And spreadsheets, super important thing. They're not just a thing that you can, you know, sell as you can put things in. They're a hugely valuable automation tool in so many ways. And <laughs> she, yeah, exactly. Um, and, and that's, and, and so, well, whether we're talking about, like building a, a customized report and exporting documents using spreadsheets to finding a physical automation solution to make it easier to know when somebody's entering a part of the building or maybe it's some kind of automation that like shuts off the lights at night you know that's a more typical traditional form of automation that's what we're diving into today and uh, I'd like this discussion to just be a big brainstorm. I think it'd be fun to have this conversation because there's so many ideas. Uh, and remember, the Float Conversations is not me presenting, okay? It's actually us having a conversation. Uh, of course, if you guys have any questions about anything that I mention, ask me. But the same thing, if Jeannie says that she does something, ask her. If Steven's over there and he's got the most genius automation tech in the world, which I already know he does and he's hiding it from us, then please share uh, or ask Steven to share with us. So uh, that said, um, these are just a couple of the basic things, but I'll start with a couple questions. Just to kind of get this kicked off, I'll give you all three of them and maybe we can kind of just pick and choose. But the first question is, is what is, what, what's your experience with automation in your float center? It's a real basic, simple one. The next one is, is what do you wish you knew more about regarding automation tools? And some of us might have some answers for you there. And then the third one is, is has anyone implemented a solution that's been a game changer for their business, Stephen? Um, that would be something also to talk about. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's get the conversation going. And, uh, you know, we'll start off by asking, I guess I'll just break the ice here. Does anyone else use spreadsheets in their automation? Yeah, I already knew you did, Jocelyn. Yes. You didn't even have to say anything. <laughs> I'd be curious to know how people use spreadsheets. Like, what what purpose do they serve for you? Did you miss Graham and Ashcon's entire presentation? No, I even have a copy of their super neat spreadsheet cheat sheet, <laughs> which I just dropped in the chat. <laughs> so I'll give you an example. Um, one problem that I faced in my float center is I felt like I had a mini call center. I don't know if any of you guys experienced this, but I was getting so many phone calls so frequently at my business that having just a phone on the table, this was back in 2018 and 19, where the voicemail of the call with the phone was actually the voicemail. So I had to get listen to each voicemail, but you would lose everything in translation. So um, I actually found a company called Callfire, and I built a sheet that 
Um, and this is a little bit more advanced. Some of us might not have this tech, but like, you know, I'd have an interactive voice response system. They'd press one for, you know, questions, two for booking, three for to leave a voicemail, and then it would go into a spreadsheet. And then that spreadsheet would allow us to track every call that came through, listen to the recorded conversation and check it off and mention a note about it. And that really helped us out a lot. Um, so that's just one example. Think of a spreadsheet like basically a user interface for anything digital. Um, so that's that's how I use it. I would imagine that more of you guys would have been more into this uh, kind of thing. But uh, yeah, it, you know, have you export a report, have something auto generate with a spreadsheet like that? That's more typical when it comes to finance. You know, um, I use it for that too. I export the in the Helm, for instance. I export the. Uh, uh, you know, all the employee timesheets, import them, import the tips, and then I have a sheet that generates and calculates everything. So, but I feel like I'm on the Graham and Ashcon side of the spectrum, uh, like, uh, you know, a, a little like s super genius. A little <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I'm like solving the world's problems when I use these spreadsheets. So I don't know. Not everyone's like that, though. So anyway, what other kind of automation tools do you guys like to use? I think Jeannie might have a question about spreadsheets. Well, yeah, go ahead. Or, no, yeah. to answer your yeah, to answer your question, I do use spreadsheets, um, and I've learned to use them very, very well recently when I'm trying to import the data from Helm into QuickBooks. So that's a a very good use of spreadsheets. Develop the formula, you know, grab the information you need, and make journal entries, and um, that's mostly how I use them. And thank God for that. Because I don't know how those numbers would ever match otherwise. Because I know you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we need that functionality. I was going to say, we use a lot of spreadsheets for the float conference, but I, I just don't know how that would be relevant to float center owners. But like your name badges are generated through a spreadsheet, our speakers and the content, the schedules, uh, the board of directors are managed, like the terms are managed through a spreadsheet, everything. Like, 80% of what we do is a spreadsheet. I just want to give a quick shout out to the new spreadsheet for float conferences that I've seen recently. They're very beautiful. I love the typography on them. So whoever created those, well done. That's Kim. My spreadsheets are not pretty. They're just functional. Well Kim done, likes to Kim. make them pretty. I, I, there's a level of design in those that's just beautiful. Thanks. I can't not do it. In fact, like sometimes I've done that to Jocelyn's and she's like, no, no. Like, I can't read it now. <laughs> <laughs> So I remember last year when we did have this conversation, there was a lot, it kind of, we kind of dived into multiple territories. And one of them was, is like, some of us may have older style tanks. Uh, and, and some of us were wondering like, how do you launch a music track or how do you get the lights to turn on after something occurs? Uh, does anyone have anything physical that they implement in their float center that they consider automation? I'm, I, I guess I'm looking for you guys to, Jump out of your comfort zone here. Like, feel free to unmute. Unmute. Chris, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that's been really useful for me is a uh, timer on our clear light sauna. Um, like, we recently implemented, like, a, an earlier sauna slot. And um, at the time, you know, one of our employees comes in, like, we wouldn't be able to heat it up in time without the timer. Um, so it automating it, turning on is super helpful. Very true. I'm getting ready for an event tonight, so you guys don't get to witness that during this call. But anyway, I um, love our timer on our sauna as well because we have a delay start. And um, we're actually looking at getting another Fire and High set up, and that will have uh, automation from our cell phones. So we'll have an app that we can control those from anywhere. So, but that delay start allows us to delay our start up to 24 hours so that we can have a nice pipe and hot sauna when we get to work in the morning. Very cool. Can you guys put links or something in the comments for that? Because I've been wanting to do that with my sauna. So whatever you use to do that. Yeah, ours actually came with the sauna type. So, I mean, Chris might have more. Gotcha. Yeah. More yeah, ours is the retrofit. Oh, uh, okay. Chris, mine is a sunlight. Yeah, mine's a clear light jacuzzi sauna, and it has the app. 
so I'll just play devil's advocate here because some people aren't comfortable with this, but I have a tendency to like look at something and say like, okay, I see how it works. Let's change it and potentially modify it, right? I'm not saying you should do that, but like, just hear me out. You can automate virtually everything, even if it doesn't have automation built into it. Because everything at the end of the day is typically, op and especially when it comes to physical things, there's a lot of things that are operated with, uh, with relays and other things like that. And even if it came down to it, like if there was just a screen where you had to hit the start button, you could technically automate something to press that button, even if it was in the physical world. So, and this is advanced stuff, right? So we're talking like crazy, crazy, weird scientist stuff. But like, if you have a sauna, it's still a box probably made out of cedar, right? I think that there's probably nothing stopping you from buying something that is a retrofit that could go in there that could also provide that form of automation. So one example of this is if you have a traditional Norwegian sauna, you don't have to use Havaria's, you know, traditional rock heater. You could buy a HUM, for instance, which many of you guys may know about. Um, and that allows you to do that automation. In fact, they sell it as retrofit. And I'm sure the similar concept probably applies to a lot of these clear lights, sunlight, and then maybe even you go to the, their websites and see if they have, uh, you know, a, a solution that might be upgradable. So... So if nobody has any suggestions on that, but uh, that's definitely a good point. I mean, being able to understand and predict when a guest is actually going to go into the thing, you know, the sauna, super valuable, right? So like, like having that available and ready for them to use when they need it and you guys find an easy solution, whether or not it be from your cell phone or be a tablet in your center, what have you. Um, I think Kim a had a... Difference. A comment or question? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, mine was uh, just, I was going to share one of the automation tools I have. So, Jonathan, if you had anything else to say on that, please do. No, I'm okay. Cool. Um, so, one of the things that we do is I really don't want my team spending a whole lot of time running around the center uh, turning on lamps. And so, we have um, smart plug timers. And so they're all set up. They can also run through if you have a, an Alexa device or something like that. But the smart plug, you can also just run through other apps without the Alexa. And so we have a lot of things that are plugged into our center, our salt lamp displays, lots of little lamps that are all throughout the center. Um, um, even like we have foot warmers that are in our salt cave. All of those things are on a, a, a smart plug timer. And there are a ton of different brands that you can use um, for those and pretty much anything that doesn't require you to physically turn something on and off. So like if it has an on off switch, you can leave it in the on position and then plug it into one of those smart timers and set a schedule using whatever app comes with um, that particular smart plug. And that just saves so much hassle and all of those little bitty things that you have to just run through uh, a center, especially if you have a, a kind of a, a cool lighting concept. Um, you know, that's a, a really great way to save a little bit of time. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Uh, Steven, you had something you wanted to add? Unmute my friend. Yeah, so we've, um, we use the helm. And so I was actually going to volunteer Chris to talk a little bit about what we've, uh, we've been and putting our inventory recently, which is, there's so much, um, for all of you that use Helm, like we're finally digging in on actually utilizing some of these great features, um, one of which is inventory. So basically that was up to me for years. Like we ran out of tissue. I would go to Amazon and order tissue or go to the store and order tissue. But what Chris has been doing is, is setting up and like inputting how many units we use. And then when that unit is gone, we get a notification and then we can just automatically order that. So I don't know if Chris wants to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I could chime in chime in a little bit. Um, so uh, I will say before any of this like could be automated, it all had to be manually inputted. You know, every single item that we had in the shop, you know, I organized it by room. I think I think it's like some like seventy four items or something that we have in shop that we purchase and rot rotate through. So it definitely took some legwork to do this. That being said, um 
you know, if you go through uh, your inventory somewhat periodically at the beginning, um, you know, I was doing it on like a bi-weekly basis, which is probably a little more recent, like a little more, uh, you know, frequent than you would have to. But, um, you know, I'd input new inventory counts, you know, every, every time. And eventually, uh, you know, it gave, uh, you know, uh, how do I say, yeah, the frequency at which items would run out. Um, and then, you know, that has informed like when we have to purchase things and it's not like, you know, I really have to be so persnickety now about, uh, you know, when, when things run out, it, the helm knows, but yeah, it took a little while to get it to, to that point, but well worth it. Certainly well worth it. That setup is so satisfying when you finally finish something like that and then it's automated. I love that. So, so let me guess, I mean, do you use a spreadsheet for that? Uh, I don't use a Google sheet like externally because the way it's organized in Helm, it, I mean, it looks like a spreadsheet per, per room. Oh, you, you know? actually use the Helm, like legit, just the Helm. Oh yeah. Yeah. For that. Yeah. Because, I mean, Very the nice. way it's organized is really nice. So uh, I, I haven't found any need for an external sheet for that. Cool. Thanks for sharing. That's a really good use of a tool that we all use. Andrew, go ahead, my friend. Hey, uh, yeah, I was just gonna say something similar to Stephen and Chris. I, for a long time, I used to do all the inventory for, at the time, three locations, and it was a lot, you know, going through the clipboard, then going to Amazon or whatever and ordering everything one at a time. Uh, so we did the same thing. We, we actually use a spreadsheet um, and we put in like conditional formatting for every item. So it'll turn, it'll be green when we have enough. It'll be yellow when it's like, we could order something, uh, but it's not it's not urgent yet. And then it turns red when it's like, we got to order right now. And so I did that, I uh, still did that by myself for a little while, but now I have a staff member at every location who's responsible for, uh, you know, doing on-site inventory and then entering everything in the spreadsheet. So then all I have to do is, is look at the spreadsheet and look for, look for the red items and it's, it's been a game changer. So, don't you love that conditional? I highly recommend formatting. automating your inventory a little bit. Oh yeah, the helm the helm thing intrigues me though. I haven't I haven't really looked into it. So. Very cool. This call is not sponsored by the helm. You know what? It it's a tool. It works. It's good. It, you know, nor is it sponsored by Google spreadsheets. But we can <laughs> say that every day of our lives. <laughs> and Jeannie, go ahead. Oh, I think Shawnee had her hand up first. Oh, Shawnee, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Shawnee. No problem. I was just curious if the inventory report in Helm had a generated spreadsheet. Does it have the CSV that you can download? Yeah, I'm pretty sure you can You can uh, export it. I've never done it, but I'm pretty sure you can. You can, yeah. Cool. So, Chris, what? Um, where is that in Helm? that you put things, I put things under tasks. I use the task sure. um, functionality a lot for mm -hmm. like deep cleaning and mopping floors on particular days or what have you. Cool, yeah, uh, tasks is great. Um, so if you want to do inventory, um, you just kind of got to click your logo in the you know upper left corner and then there's a tab that says inventory, you know, assuming you have the permissions to look at it. Um, and then, yeah, it's organized into like four main categories, which is, uh, well, I guess three really. It's products, orders, and vendors. And um, yeah, but it's really it's right in the main drop down menu from from the top left. Um, I would say to do like to do all of it, um, just the initial like upfront work. I don't know. Maybe took me like somewhere in between like eight and. 15 hours to get it really dialed like over the course of a bunch a bunch of um you know bunch of months and, and weeks of inputting inventory so go ahead me yeah sorry red lotus okay, thank you sorry yeah um so chris it's i just want to say this is one of the things i planned on hunting and gathering information about when I went to the conference. So it's kind of cool that we're talking about it here. 
for that, I, I've entered my, I, I use my inventory. The challenge I have is what, what I'm hearing you say is that you still have to manually kind of take account. It doesn't, so has anybody used their, like, um, like a sales ticket to remove stuff from inventory so you don't actually have to um, take the physical count? It'll actually keep track of it because you're removing it from inventory. Does that make sense? My booking do system, I don't, I don't use Helm, but my booking system does that. But mm -hmm. it's still a best practice because there's always product loss, especially if we're talking about retail products and things. Yeah. Um. You know, no matter what, things people are going to ring up the wrong item, stuff's going to get stolen or whatever. Whatever. So, 100%, um, but as far yeah. as like knowing when I need to reorder, I get automated emails. I set a threshold for each item and get automated emails on that. So, um, I don't know if Helm has a function like that. I, that's, I, I can kind of speak to it. Yeah. Um. It, they actually do. Uh, so I can I can give you some insight. And I think, Chris, you probably know this, but there are two categories. There's a retail, literally for sale in shop. And then there's a supply used in shop function. The difference between the two is the retail for sale in shop actually tracks based on the point of sale and the line item that's added to the sale. In fact, if you have a barcode on whatever product that you're selling and you scan that barcode in the UPC space, or this SKU, you can then rescan that barcode at the point of sale, and it will actually identify the item in your inventory in the helm. It will do tracking, and then you can actually set when the threshold is for reordering. And uh, it's really great. Now, I think what Chris is doing with the just general products is pretty cool too, because I mean, gosh, there are things, but we just kind of notice that they're getting low and order them. But if you have a really organized tracking method like you guys sounds like you do i uh, go with the flow that, that that's pretty impressive i must say oh no retail okay that's interesting so you guys are doing it from a little bit different angle yeah so, so all Chris, supplies. are you talking about things like you know q-tips for the rooms and like chemicals for your tanks and things like that or like towels or what like just everything that you're using you're on mute still by the way chris you're on mute. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm just nodding because I'm like, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> uh, so for, you know, let me just go into our supply closet, for example, and just read off a couple items so you get like a flavor of what this is all for. Like Arm & Hammer liquid laundry detergent, uh, Argan oil leave-in shampoo conditioner, Camco water filter hose, Christpaul PBR filter, shampoo, Q-tips, Ricola, Scott multifold seafold towel, like you know, I have everything organized by room. So like when I'm doing inventory, I was like, okay, this is where the things are. And these are all the things in that location. And yeah, that's how I decided to organize it. Um, and yeah, the nice thing too, is that it's, you know, we decided to, for the vast majority of things, there's some things that we still buy retail, but um, it's all, we order basically everything on Amazon. And the way that, um, like the order numbers from Amazon just like seamlessly integrate into uh, the inventory just makes it so convenient to be like, oh, these are the things empty, make like a whatever batch order on Amazon. And um, so, yeah, this it's for all of our supplies we use we use this for. It's actually kind of cool, too, because it has a link that you can click even if you set it, if you use all the features of it. Right. Yeah. So you figured out like every three weeks we need to order so and so amount of q-tips or whatever obviously not yes. exactly that and then yes. it just tells you or reminds you to order those things uh essentially yes and the nice thing about it is it only becomes more refined over time uh, also i really hope you have a really good credit card with amazon rewards points because you could be saving a lot of money and i'd be happy to tell you what the float conference uses <laughs> american express business prime we actually have, yeah. Is that what? Yeah, you that's have? what you use. How do you know that's that? What I use. I have like fifteen hundred dollars <laughs> so in points. So anyway. yeah. Like, Sorry, I didn't like, mean to give away the secret. I just <laughs> Amazon Sorry. points for the win. Uh, anyway, there you go. That's an automation strategy. You know, get a card with good points. Um, really cool. I like. I like the. I like the. Uh, I like the inventory angle. I really do. And I think that's great. I wanted to kind of pivot back to what Kim was saying, though, with a little bit with like the light automation. 
um, because I think it's such an important thing. And, and I, I wanted to gauge, maybe we're all using the same lights, but like for the float suites themselves, you know, the shower rooms, not the actual tanks. What are you guys using for like lights in there? You know, like the switches on the walls. They automated, are they Lutrion? Motion, motion sensing? Sensor. Mm -hmm. Shawnee. Yeah, yeah, I use Philip Hughes and they're motion censored, but we can also control them from our iPad. So it makes it super convenient to just check on our people when they're out of tanks because the lights will come on and then we can shut off the tanks lights from that app. So it's great. Very cool. Steven says, I don't know what motion sensors are. No, I think Chris was trying to say that he doesn't know what type of motion sensors they have. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't know what that. that's okay i just i just wanted to get a gauge i, I like that angle that you took too shawnee so so it sounds like your float center you, you you have quite a bit of unique tech that you have running in the float center um i i was fortunate to you know build in the last three years and there's a lot of great stuff that people i was utilizing introduced and recommended and also just scouring float collective for all the tips and tricks that everybody had been doing um, I like where Kim was talking also about those plugins. I have a very automated home. I have um, the home pod and I can tell it to wind down at night and it turns on my sleep frequencies and my lights go on and off on voice command. So I'm hoping to do a lot of that to the center as well. That's really cool. That's really cool. I, I could tell, you know, I, I could tell you that I have some really unique ones go ahead chris go ahead yo i'm just curious um something that bothers me sometimes is that uh i wish our laundry machines had an automated spin cycle that occurs immediately after our our normal wash that would be so clutch and i'm wondering if anyone else has speed queens uh and if they know a way to do this um well, let me just give you a suggestion. Here's how I think about things. And if you have a product, just search the product on Google and type in hack or mod after it. And there will be a form likely that pops up that will tell you everything you need to know about how to modify that product. Um, and uh, I have done this with basically every single thing I've ever bought. And uh, you, you, somebody out there, has already thought about this, Chris, and or maybe. And if they haven't, then I mean, maybe you're on to something new that needs to be done. I don't know. <laughs> I know uh, Andy Larson at, in Milwaukee, they have their, did anyone go to that, um, visit his float center at that conference and see his washing machines? I'm pretty sure he had the, uh, like the, the detergent automated. Like he didn't even have mm -hmm. to add the, Kind of like maybe what we use for if we're for anyone who has superiors with the h202 the automatic oh, okay. there which is another you know something that is a great feature for no one that has uh the automatic dosers for h202 but he's pulling it from uh, a laundry detergent vessel right into his washer i just curious does anyone in this group have any automation experience like programming or any basic automation like with selenium or anything like that so you can really dive deep down the rabbit hole i will tell you when it comes to automation uh, like i was saying before anything can be automated like you know you have tiny computers like like this thing here it's it's an esp8266 chip it will basically do everything you could ever imagine including run automated lights a switch and then you got like a Raspberry Pi like this. And maybe you guys might have these in your float center, but like a product that you bought came with something like this tiny computer. Um, here's something that I do. I have this makeup room, okay? And there's a door on the back and the front. The back door is access to the laundry area in the mechanical chase. And I don't want my float guides to enter the laundry room or the makeup room while somebody's in there because it would freak them out. So what I did was, is I put this light on the wall outside the door and there's a motion sensor on the inside of the room. And I just basically have this mo 
a roof mounted motion sensor trigger the light on the outside of the wall to turn it on so like sometimes you can utilize tech that isn't like intended necessarily for that but utilize it in a creative way to be able to identify certain things that need to be done you know and 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 it and it can really change the way that you operate your business and and just your life in general so yeah what about like how to how your float room tells you if the person's out of the tank like shani i think said she uses motion sensor and the app can tell if the person is moving around in the room and i know like at float on they have a sensor in their showers so you can tell when the shower is running after the float and that's how they know it's okay to run the um filters yeah shani go ahead um, yeah, I was just going to comment much the same, like when we're in our back room doing laundry, we can't always hear the front door. So we have this nice little tool that only puts a doorbell in the back room and not throughout the whole center. Those are super easy to order off of Amazon. And then um, I will probably talk about like security cameras or security systems later, but um, I really like the fact that my security system pops up a notification right when somebody disarms my center. So I know exactly when my team gets there, exactly when they're leaving. Um, it's if anybody checks in, cause we have a few clients who have like unlimited Novathor use, they go in early in the morning and I can keep it all under lock and key cause they have their own code to get into the system. They have their own key. I have cameras everywhere. So all of that really allows me to expand the way I provide services for my clients. I second that notion about the cameras, by the way. Inappropriate, obvious places, right, in the float center. Uh, having access yeah, they're, to... They're not through. exactly in the rooms, but right outside, you know, in the hallway, yeah. they're, all, they're all covered, so... I, I think that awareness of, of your location, some of us have bigger locations than others, but like, you know, if you have a very large facility, having the ability to know where people are at all times can really help out a lot. Uh, this is something that came up last year too. I don't know if you use the same one, Ashani, but um, there's a, a there's these devices. They're from Dakota Alert Systems, and they're pagers. They can actually go completely silent and just vibrate. And there's twelve different tones that can be used, including like door read switches. There's a normally open, normally closed signal on all of these devices too, and a button. So like literally every single aspect of notifying could be accomplished with one device and we use this to know exactly what door opens in any of our suites at any time if somebody steps on a on a mat near the shoes so we can greet them when they leave if they come through the front door there's a button at the front desk and uh, there's even a, a, a relay triggered to our phone system so if somebody calls this thing goes off in fact, you might have heard some birds tweeting that somebody leaving the float center. So uh, it's it's a pretty amazing tool that helps us out a lot too. And it's kind of a form of automation because we got to know what's happening, right? So how does other people do that? I like Shawnee's idea though. I remember when I was at your float center, Kristen, you had some, you had some, uh, you had some uh, 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 observational tools, didn't you? The know when things were happening? um kind of we we have chimes on on the front door so we can hear them when people come in we do we used to have um doorbells and things that people could press if they needed something for the rooms but um they've basically gone unused so um i'm liking the idea of the little sensor going off on the door we don't have anything like that but we do have cameras throughout the center which um, I can check from time to time. And uh, it has saved us a lot of grief and a lot of hassle because when things happen, we can always refer to the cameras and it actually saves the employees. It actually, the, the employees usually come out on top when it comes to customer complaints with those cameras. And I could just pull up the, the, the little video and say, well, they were actually quite polite to you, you know, and it kind of just, shuts people down, you know, when they're coming at and saying that the, the employees are rude. So th that's fantastic. I love having the cameras around. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt. I'll, I'll share, a I'll share a link. That we have. 
that we have to have that conversation that your staff are being polite and you're having to like prove that your staff are being polite. Like, I'm glad that you can prove it, but like, just be nice to each other. People come on. Mm -hmm. Side note, I'll share a link to, to the product so you guys can know what I'm talking about personally. Um, I know it was very helpful for people last year too. And if anyone else has anything to drop in the comments, please, please do. Cause like I said, that's all helpful for folks that might want to implement something similar. Cool. So, um, any other thoughts about like automation? We've talked a little bit about the, Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. We have some people with their hands raised. I apologize. I think Tanya was first. Tanya, go ahead. We have you, Tanya. Otherwise, if Tanya is not available, I know that uh, Andrew, you were you were thinking about. Oh, I'm here. I'm oh, here. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Not my friend. It just took a hot minute to figure out how to get off mute. Oh. Okay. No, for for me, my location isn't in a strip mall or anything like that. It's a three story tall building built in the 1840s. So for us to keep track of where people are at times can be kind of crazy, especially on weekends. So I like what both Shawnee and Jonathan were sharing because that's something I needed to figure out because I didn't want to do anything that was loud and disruptive, but yet needing a way to keep track of when someone's entering and exiting an area. So th that's, I mean, that was alone worth the call today. Yes. And, and those links, I mean, I'm serious when I say like th this, this pager, the second link I just posted, it's like a game changer. Once you start using it, you'll be like, how do we operate without it? At least that's how I feel. So like, remember how I proposed the questions in the beginning? Has anyone implemented anything that was like a super huge game changer for them? Um, because I can tell you for me personally, it has been like, just having notifications around the float center, having cameras. I don't even know if I could operate without some of this stuff. So anyway, Tanya, uh, or I mean, Andrew, you had your hand up before. Did you have anything you'd like to add, buddy? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say we use uh, Simply Safe uh, for at all of our locations. I like the idea of Dakota Systems. I'm going to look into that. But um, with Simply Safe, you've got the cameras, you've got entry uh, alarm sensors. Um, not only good for um, you know people coming and going throughout the day, but uh, like Kim was saying, I know when the employees clock in and when they clock out. Um, I know when people leave late at night after an after shift float, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but what's been um, a lifesaver is we have one location in particular that was, uh, we moved into it, we took over this location and they didn't put any floor drains uh, in the rooms. And so uh, what we did is we got water sensors, um, leak sensors uh, through Simply Safe that attach or go into our security system. And uh, it sucks. I've had a couple situations where we've had, a, we've had a leak in the filtration system and I get a phone call at three in the morning. Uh, <laughs> so I rushed down to the float center to take care of it, but it's 10 times better to get a call at three in the morning than to have you know several hours go by where it's still leaking and your your staff comes in in the morning to something a lot worse so i i cannot even empathize enough because we've had the same we used to have major flooding in our center finally we got mm -hmm. some issues resolved but um we have the little govi i can't remember andrew if you said what brand uh, but we have the govi water sensors and we get um, an email and of mm -hmm. course they're really really loud so if we are at the center the team knows to like run and find mm -hmm. whatever it is like right then. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But those things are amazing. I'll drop a link in for the ones that I have. There's definitely times where staff are like doing some deep cleaning and it goes off. <laughs> it's kind of funny that way, but but well, yeah, definitely a, definitely a lifesaver. It's interesting too because I just saw this on the collective. I think somebody posted like how much they love their water sensor and. I have to admit, it's not something that I've implemented yet. So I think uh, I think I'm the the, the I, I still have I'm still trying to figure out what the best one is. So so is there a is there a consensus here? I I just like Simply Safe because we have a security system that it oh gotcha you know it integrates with. So, but I'm sure there's plenty. 
Kim, do you have a, sen a water sensor in your on your front door for when it <laughs> floods from the rain too? <laughs> yes, exactly. That's why we got them. Um, it was for the front door because it, it was just, it was too much. And then we have them strategically placed throughout the center as well, like in our filtration rooms and things like that, um, just in case. Uh, and I like the one that I have, I think will allow up to like 10 devices on one. And it also has an app. And I always forget about that because my husband uh, is in charge of the app. So he gets a notification on his app if we get it. And then we get the email as well. And so that's, it is so helpful uh, when you're not there. And if you ever have any kind of issues at all, you know, I mean, I, there are so many stories about people like forgetting that they're filling a tank or they left a hose in and you walk out of the room. Like having a sensor like that is, it's annoying if you do get it wrong, if you accidentally spray it, if it gets any kind of moisture, it's going to let you know. Um, but it has saved us from tremendous damage several times. So. It, it is interesting too that you mentioned that because it's like we almost don't know what we need necessarily until we operate in our building. So like mentioning that there's a specific feature about our location that is unique and we need to find or invent something to solve for that. And we often do this all the time in all aspects of our lives. That's kind of what we're talking about when we talk about automation. Like how do we make the situations manageable and easier? Because if we didn't, well, I mean, we probably wouldn't be here right now, right? So <laughs> that's the point. I all think right. Chris had uh, his hand up too. Did you have something yeah. else to say? Yeah, I actually was gonna ask about water sensor brands. So thank you. Oh. Yeah, I saw something on the collective recently too that I thought was extremely compelling. Um, so thanks. Cool. And did Tanya have something else to say, or was your hand just still up from before? No, I'm just okay. in my own little world. That's okay. Um, and now Shawnee's hand is up too. Did you have something else to share? I just to ask. So on those water sensors, is there the ability to turn them off? Because I, I'd hate for a really loud sensor to go off while we're cleaning a room that gets sprayed. So is there that ability? As soon as it's dry is what mine does. As soon as it's actually, the unit itself is dry. So if you pick it up and dry off the bottom of it, you're good. Um, it, it should go off pretty quickly. So, so I, I guess that goes back to like the strategic placement is like mm -hmm. putting them in places where they're not getting wet when they're supposed to be getting wet, right? Yes. Yes. And just they're so I mean, they're tiny, like it's like this big. If you're deep cleaning and it's visible, just pick it up. And I've had to have that conversation with my team of like, oh, well, I was cleaning the window and I sprayed the window cleaner and like a drop, you know, fell on. I'm like, move it. <laughs> like That's the simplest thing is just move it out of the way, do your cleaning and then put it back um, because they are very, very, at least the ones we have, they're very sensitive. And I want that it while it is annoying sometimes if we're doing, you know, cleans, um, I want it because I need to know the second water comes in through my front door or, you know, in our filtration room, there's never a reason that water should be on the, the floor um, in the filtration rooms. And so all of those are reasons that I want to run and I want to know about it like immediately. So. Mm -hmm. So. I wanted to mention something that's interesting about this conversation too. Like how did we all come to this point where we started realizing that these things actually existed? Because one of us at some point had to look this up or realize that this was a problem. And I think that the practice of determining how we find automation in our lives is also just as important as the automation itself. And I just want to go back to, I think it was Chris, who we went to float Milwaukee and we looked up the automated laundry detergent. I just looked it up on, on, uh, on Amazon and <laughs> stuff you find is ridiculous. Um, basically if there's something that you guys have a problem at your business, I just feel like all it really takes is just looking it up on Google or Amazon. And usually you'll find something that relates to your problem. And I think that that's one of the core things about how automation, how this journey of automation emerges, right? I mean, I'm curious, like Kim, Andrew, Chris, Tanya, Shawnee, how, how do you guys find your automation solutions? Well, experience is a wonderful teacher. 
And so, yes. Yeah, so when you have something go wrong, exactly that, I go search the Float Collective or Amazon for solutions. But I wanted to comment that I think AI is going to help us as business um, owners immensely because there's going to be, especially if we can utilize it as an industry to just put this information into a shareable form where we can just ask questions and they'll pop up all all of the experience that we've all paid for and gone through for the last several years of business ownership, specifically float business ownership. Somebody download the float collective and put it into a GPT. Bam, there you go. Float float center owner GPT. <laughs> I'm really kidding, but I'm not. I know it will happen eventually because this is the world we live in. Um, you all know that's going to happen, right? Um, <laughs> Good point. And I think that it's safe to say that that's probably what we all do. I mean, we all utilize the collective when somebody comes up with a cool idea. We're like, wow, that's a really great idea. Let's let's move into that and and really and really roll with it. And and, and it's it's here to help us out. So that's why for me and I know a lot of us, we're all willing to share. We all just share these ideas with one another because eventually we get to a better place where we all operate more efficiently. I wanted to give the opportunity for anyone else here to also speak, but Chris, go ahead. Hi. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe maybe a kind of strange angle, but the thing that has honestly been the most inspiring for me to like try and optimize systems, and often when a system is like needing to be optimized, there's some automation that's bound to be involved, um, has been like coming from from a professional development angle. It's like here I am facilitating floats at at Go with the Float and. Um, you know, while that is uh, amazing and great, it's like, okay, what else can I do to kind of further my skill set? And um, yeah, all these different projects with the helm and uh, yeah, all these little things have really like made me, uh, yeah, feel like more involved with, um, yeah, just like the industry in, in general and also with, with, with the center itself. Um, and that has like given my, my role here more of a sense of purpose. So I think, um, you know, I think most of y'all are probably owners here and not necessarily employees. But um, yeah, I felt very empowered by by Stephen to kind of take this stuff on and um, use it as like a, you know, an avenue for professional development. So it's been meaningful to me in that way. Thank you for sharing. I know it. It has for me too. And and one thing that's been great about this industry, and and I know it's kind of a shout out to the Flow Collective a little bit, but we have an industry forum and we can utilize that to find answers. And when I first was building my float center, if I was having a problem, like I can't find a mat that doesn't slip around the float suite, right? Because it's so slippery, whatever. And I found these spaghetti ramen noodle mats and, and I could not figure out what the name of them were for the life of me. All I knew is they look like ramen noodles and I had to find them. And, and if anybody who's laughing right now probably knows what I'm talking about here. <laughs> so eventually I found this post where it's like, this is the spaghetti ramen noodle mat. And then bam, I, I bought them and I'm like, dude, this is gold because I couldn't find them. So I know what, what mats you're talking about. That's what funny. are spaghetti ramen noodle mats and what do they do? Because like, I feel can like you I send us it. the link, please? You stole it, but I, I just yeah, don't yeah, know so why Half I need of us it. are like, yeah, I know what you're talking about. The other half are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's just these mats that look like a like you open up a brand new thing of ramen noodles and they look like ramen noodles and and they just don't slip around the float speed as much. But, I, I, they have some like lufa kind of. Yeah. appearance to them. Mine are gray though. You can get them in different colors. Mine don't look like ramen noodles, but they're perfect for when they step out of the flow. Just they don't slip at all. So I've upgraded mine to the non ramen noodle style as well that don't look as much like ramen noodles. I'll share with you guys. Yeah. Even I knew what they were, Kim, and I'm <laughs> a poor boy. Come on. Yeah. If you search Lufa mat, Lufa shower mat, it comes up. <laughs> Don't search now, ramen noodle mat. By the way. Jonathan searching ramen noodle shower mat. Right? I don't think they'll show up. Are they? They they look like they would be a little abrasive on the skin. 
No, they're pretty. Mine are pretty soft. Interesting. I, they're not. They're not made out of loofah. They yeah. just look like they are. So, yeah. they're yeah. They and we just added those because we had like texture poured into our cultured marble that wasn't really effective against salt water. <laughs> so, um, we've tried everything: bamboo, non-slip, and these have been these have been the best by far. Nice. Just just look at the picture. Oh, yeah. Somebody else found the same thing I was just going to look yeah. at. Sorry, I dropped you can the wrong see what, Sorry what the ramen noodle kind of pattern looks like and, and just kind of understand. Do you see why I say ramen noodle, though? Like, it kind of looks like. And not to say yeah. that I sit here and eat ramen noodles all day. I did way back when I was poor. And I'm, I'm a little still poor so sometimes. But, like, you got to have ramen noodles once in a while. And when you know what a pack of ramen looks like, you just do. So there you go. <laughs> Anyway, Good question. Yeah. Do they wash up very well? I mean, do they hold up to being yeah, washed? So during our deep clean, we literally make a vat of like hydrogen peroxide water and we dip the ramen noodle mats in there and weigh them down in there in the, the tub starts boiling. It's the craziest reaction I've ever seen in my life, but it does clean those mats. And I guarantee if Roy was here, he'd be like, he'd be like, yep, that right there, that, that. So Roy is going, here. It's called the catalase reaction. It's the bacteria growing on the mat, just destroying the hydrogen peroxide. So is that actually, is the hydrogen peroxide doing anything then? It's, it's uh, killing the bacteria. Oh, good. Okay. So at least we're doing something right. right? Yeah. You've got an indication you've got biofilm growing on your ramen noodle mat. <laughs> Johnny, go ahead. Yeah. So we actually only, we have enough to use ours through two um, rotations. And then we soak it in a chlorine bleach and then we dry them. We have a laundry dryer like that you do for sweaters and shirts and we dry them overnight. So we have enough on hand to rotate that through. But we're fortunate we only have one tank that we really need them for because my other tanks have um, the tacaron flooring and, and don't need them. But we had one that you stepped right out into the shower. So so we just rotate through ours. We have three of them. and wash them after two and hang them overnight. Is that good practice, Roy? Or am I overkill? No, you're, you're better off using a bleach on them, Johnny. Uh, the peroxide will get you somewhere, but you'll have a better kill with your uh, chlorine bleach. Dang, I wish Alex was here right now. Because she needs to hear this. Actually, I'm just going to write a note, and this is where more automation comes into play. It's going to be well, recorded. We can send her the video. Yeah, well, she well, maybe, some, she, she maybe will, some of this will be discussed during float conference during a certain talk that somebody yeah, well, might be I mean, saying. I don't know. I, I don't actually have the final say in these things anymore. That will literally challenge me. Like, nope, nope, that's not how we're doing things, John. Like, nope, that's not it's not it. <laughs> Go ahead, Jeannie. Shawnee, do you um change them out between each client or do you just do it at the end of the day? Um, no, so we change them out. We only allow for two floats. So we do spray it with hydrogen peroxide after each float, and then we clean it with water. And then after two floats or two uses, that's when we take it back and we and we soak it in the bleach solution and then hang them all up overnight to dry. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. So just to get back to the point, I found this thing on the collective. You see what I did there? I just rotated right back to where I started. The point was, is that the ramen noodle mats came as a result of me trying to find a solution for people slipping around. And that was the only way that I could solve it. So this happens, I think, with everyone. Like, think about us when we're thinking about the shower dispensers on the walls. Somebody's posted about that. And we've all probably looked that up and realized that those simple human shower dispensers that randomly fall off the walls can be attached correctly, but we have to find the right way to do it. Or maybe you use a different solution. Like I know Kim's float center, she has individually beautiful, beautifully placed bottles that we kind of replicated at our center recently because Rachel, my manager, was super inspired by it. And she was like, get those other dispensers off the wall. So you don't know uh, we, how happy I am to hear that you said that yours randomly fall off the wall because I've had that happen twice. Yeah, it does. Oh, yeah. So I'm getting ready to get the drill out. 
we have eye wash in each of our rooms now because when one of them fell off, a big glob of shampoo jumped into my eye and I couldn't get water to get it out. And it was painful. And I was like, if I have a client that ever experienced this, it would not be good for me. And so, yeah, I those pop off for us a lot. So I'm going to go search for that in the collective. I haven't come across that. We, we've got like the normal hand pump things, the, the three on the wall. And what we've done is underneath where the bottle drops down, there's actually a hole. And we've just put a cable tie, a very small cable tie underneath that. And that's actually stopped the that whole container coming out. So I don't know if anyone else uses the same, but just uh, throwing it out there for you. Thank you. Is there, Thank you. is there an automation where you can have the float collective send you a message or an email if like really popular topics <laughs> or discussions happen? I mean, Facebook does that natively. They'll send out notifications that say there's a conversation you might like in this group. So uh, it, it, periodically, or it'll show up like in your feed. Um, so, so technically speaking, it, it's called Selenium and mm -hmm. it does work, but it is it's like high level programming now. So it could be a little complicating, but it is possible. So. There's a difference between is the automation possible? Yes. Is the automation complex enough to where you might have to be an engineer to do it? Yes. <laughs> so they're just different levels of complexity, you know? Yeah, I don't um, have time for that. <laughs> yeah. I want to make sure we're on time. Uh, uh, and Jocelyn, you, you're the master of time on this one. Uh, but we're at six. I didn't know if there was anyone else that had any other thoughts about automation before we start to wrap up this float conversation today. Don't be shy. That's why we're here. Ask questions. Participate. Share with us all your super deep secrets of automation. No? Well, I want to thank everyone regardless for visiting us today. Remember, this is a recorded float conversation. So, And I think that for this one, it's useful because this is actually valuable information that you can take with you, hopefully. Uh, and, and I know me for me personally, if anyone has any questions about anything automation or any product or anything, just you can also just send me a message. You know, I'm on the Float Collective at Jonathan Rogue, uh, J Rogue at Float Light, or just get a hold of me. Go ahead, Shani. I just am curious when this is recorded, are the links also recorded so that we have access to those? Can we? Mm. Good. Or do question. we have to take a picture of all that right now? Because I'm not, I haven't been in a position to like look them up and put them just in my. Just copied the whole thing for you, Shani. Oh, you're wonderful. Thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> I'm going to send that to Jocelyn now so she can uh, do what she does with it. Distribute it. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, this has been great, guys. Thank you. Thank you for everyone who shared. Chris, Steven, Shawnee, Andrew, Jeannie, um, Kim, Jocelyn, you guys, all, all everyone here, you guys have had such great ideas. And that's the whole point. You know, I think that we are really like a bootstrap kind of business. You know, we just kind of figure it out as we go. There is no right or wrong way to do this. I mean, I guess there is a wrong way. If, if, if Roy tells us it's wrong, don't do it that way. <laughs> But, but for the most part, like, you know, when it comes to the harmless things, like, you know, it, we're a little bit of experimentalists, you know, like we try something, if it doesn't work, we go on to the next thing. So, uh, and that's the kind of nature and spirit of this industry that I think is beautiful. So, uh, and also come to float conference too, by the way, because this is what really we're going to be talking about. Imagine this, but I R L. And for those who don't know and that for means three in real days. Life. Three days. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you remember when the flow conference is, Jonathan? Tell us the dates. Oh, okay. Uh, it is August 9th, 10th, 11th, and then, you know, where is it? juice to come. It's in San Antonio, Texas, y'all. Come right. on. Yeah. <laughs> and we're staying at the coolest hotel ever on the Riverwalk. It's going to be beautiful. I hope y'all are there. I know I'm going to be there. I'm going to bring like six of my crew members, too, so I'm rolling deep. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, so it's gonna I, be fun. I just had one last comment and I didn't realize how popular this response was on Float Collective, but 
it's not necessarily automation, but it has helped our laundry big time. We started getting hair turbans instead of towels, and it's made all the difference in our laundry. Like we we implemented it right before Valentine's because we have tons of couples that come through, and um, you can put like three times as many turbans in there as you can towels in the wash and dryer, and they they dry quick and it was a really great implementation and one of my team came up with that Cameron who not many of you've met he's pretty incredible came up with that because he's got these long beautiful locks of hair so he's always thinking everything hair um anyway it's been a game changer hair turbans you leave them in the suites yep yep so we we used to have two towels and uh, per float and now we just have a hair turban and a towel we do that with, but ours are by request. But the the amazing thing is, people love them so much that they buy them. Like, and so we sell them in two packs for twenty bucks, and um, they buy them awesome. like crazy. Awesome! That's mm -hmm. next level. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have to implement that next. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> and, and for anybody, before we jump off, if you're willing to share, no no expectations, but I would love to know where you buy your product from here, Hair Turbans, because I have to implement this. This is exactly the reason why we're here, because I am definitely now getting this product, because I know exactly what you mean. These ch these hairs on people's heads, it, it's like a huge towel, and it's, it's huge. And now I'm realizing, like, why do we have so much laundry? I have to buy a second laundry and dryer. <laughs> Yeah, you can find them on um, FAIR. Mandy just mentioned that. Um, but I, a lot of them on FAIR, I, I just didn't like the, the style or the price or you had to buy too many or whatever. So I have these on subscribe and save and I get a couple so I don't keep a ton in stock, but we always have at least probably 10 packs that are available for purchase in addition to what we keep. Um, and then, you know, we just order more as we need them. So kind of fun. Awesome. And I just posted the conversation on an email to you, Jocelyn. So you'll have that. And uh, yeah, I think that's everything, friends. So we'll see you all at Flow Conference. And uh, yeah, we'll talk soon. Love you Thanks all. Thanks for hosting, Jonathan. You guys. You're very Thank welcome. You, Jonathan. My pleasure, of course. Bye, Bye now. Bye, everybody.